Give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear me okay. All right. Very good. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I, uh, my name is Phil Bond. I'm with the Plan Giving and Trust Services Department with the Florida Conference. And I'm here today to bring you greetings from our president, Alan Machado, uh, and the rest of the executive committee. Uh, the Holy Spirit is at work at the conference offices and leading us to recommit ourselves to the purpose for which we were established. What is that purpose? That purpose is to spread the gospel both locally within our conference and internationally, to help where we can internationally. So we are committed to that. Uh, I want to thank Pastor Machado, Alan Machado, our president, for his efforts. I also want to thank uh, Pastor Scott for allowing me to be here today with you. And um, I want to ask you something. I want to ask you, when is the last time you prayed for him? We, all, we just all had, had community prayer and prayed for different people. When's the last time you prayed for Pastor Scott and the rest of the leadership team here? Bob and Brooke and everybody else? I'm glad to hear that. Um, you know, Satan attacks each one of us in different ways, but you can imagine how much more he attacks the leaders of, of God's church. And so I'd like to pause right now and just pray for them and pray for our time together. Would you join me, please? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the Sabbath day. Uh, so many people look at it as a burden and wonder how we are able to set aside this day. But Lord, we know that it is a gift. It is a gift that you give everybody and those particularly who, will, who partake of it. And Lord, um, as we think of the blessings that you bestow upon us, we think of the leaders of this particular church. Think of Scott and the rest of his leadership team and his family. I ask, Father, for your protection, your hedge of protection around them. Um, rebuke Satan and his attempts to attack them and this church and, uh, and just bless them in a mighty way. And Lord, I also ask for, for your presence to be here in a special way as, uh, as we study your word. And um, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So I've been the director of this department, of this ministry, for about 12 years now. And our mission is to help our members be purposeful and intentional in their stewardship through their estate planning. Your estate plan is how you leave a legacy demonstrating uh, you know, what you've believed in in your life. And that's what your legacy can be. Is it a legacy that would say, you know, if someone looked back at that person's life, yes, he, she was definitely a Christian. Or would they say, well, I don't know what they believed. You know, it's interesting. I had the, the privilege of serving as an executor in Florida. We call it personal representative of a lady's estate who had passed away. And so I went into her home. She lived right here in Mount Dora. Well, not here, but just up the road in Mount Dora. And went into her home. First time anybody had been there in about a week, um, you know, to just see what was happening with, with everything. And um, first thing I saw on her dining room table was her Bible and her quarterly. And you knew that she had been there studying, you know, just just before she had passed. So what a witness that was to me and to you know, her family as, as people came in and saw that. So I think a, the legacy that we leave is very, very important. There are certain documents that you need to establish your legacy. Okay, And, and one of those is uh, a last will and testament. And I want to encourage everybody to consider... Uh, making sure that you have that document as well as some others that I'm going to mention. There are particular reasons, and, and I, 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 I look back over the 12 years that I've been there, and I think of dear members. Um, I think of one lady, her name was Donna, and it was a second marriage for her. And her husband suddenly passed away. He was young, my age, I mean real young. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, she was 
devastated to find out that because it was a second marriage and the laws provided that and he didn't have a will the laws provided that his kid from his first marriage got 70 percent of his estate she was by law entitled to 30 percent but that meant that she basically had to go find housing and, and basically start all over again. You know, they had had a nice house and all that. Um, so it was quite devastating, you know, to, to her. I think of another couple. <clears throat> I'm not going to mention their name because they're from this area. They had done their wills online. And um, some of you may know who I'm talking about. It was a mess. Because the, the online stuff just doesn't cover everything that needs to be covered. It doesn't in, instruct you or coach you on how to sign documents correctly. So that if they're not signed correctly, guess what? They're not valid. So uh, that's why we have this ministry. Um, an, an, an additional document other than last will and testament is a power of attorney. This document... Uh, enables you to uh, authorize somebody to make decisions on your behalf uh, if you become incapacitated. Very, very important document. Um, I think of a lady that called me one time. Her name was Mary. I won't say her last name, but she called and she was panicked. And she said, hey, Phil, do you have a copy of the power of attorney that we, that we did with you guys? And I said, no, I don't, let me go check the vault. You know, we keep everything in a vault. And I said, let me go just, you know, pull it. She said, can I hold while you do that? And I said, yeah, sure. So ran over to the vault. Took me a couple of, couple of three minutes when I came back. I said, Mary, we've got it. I said, you sound panicked. What, what's the urgency? She said, my husband has come down with dementia. And fortunately, he has long-term care insurance. But they won't even talk to me unless I have this power of attorney. And, and he can't do it for himself. He was too far gone. So, you know, a, a document like that can be really, really important. Um, I think of Vera, Vera Prokop. I doubt you know her. She was from the Avon Park area. But she, um, she developed dementia, uh, didn't have, she, she had a son-in-law, but he lived up in Wisconsin, lives up in Wisconsin, not very close. Neighbors found her. She was in the front yard in her nightgown. And... Uh, not in the way that any of us would want to be, right? And so they knew. she had. That's how, you know. But anyway, um, we were able, she had named actually the church to be her power of attorney. And we were able to help her. And one thing that Vera loved more than anything was fresh fruit. Really loved fresh fruit. Well, you know, when you go into a facility, you know what kind of fruit they give you, right? It's in those little tubs. And it's got that really thick syrup, you know, and it's, it's kind of tasty, but it has nothing to do with anything fresh, that's for sure. But because we had the power of attorney, we were able to uh, make sure that Vera had fresh fruit every week. So we were able to pay somebody to go shopping for her and bring that in and even pay somebody to take her to church because she could still get around. She just wasn't, you know able to to live on her own anymore so things like a power of drink now you know i'm really going to date you guys and myself when i give you this last example this this lady was not adventist it was actually kind of before my time does anybody in this room when i used to tell this story every hand in the room went up but now not so much does anybody remember the name terry shrivo couple folks couple folks she um, uh, went into a coma, basically, young lady, uh, I don't know, in her 30s, early 40s, went into a coma, and um, her husband did not believe she would want to live as a vegetable, as, as, you know, without her brain functioning, because that's ultimately what happened. But her parents just couldn't bear to lose their daughter. So... The husband and the parents went at it like this for 17 years. 17 years they fought it out in the courts. Let me tell you, the only people that won on that case was the attorneys. Okay? Finally, Jeb Bush, who happened to be governor of Florida at this time, this is what, maybe 20 years ago now, 
weighed in on the case, and ultimately they decided that it'd be okay to, to pull the plug and, and let her pass, you know, peacefully. But had she had a document called a living will, then she could have expressed her own wishes. I'd like to, if, if AV is ready, I would like to show a real life video just happened a, a couple years ago to actually somebody in our office. And so I'd like to share that with you if you could join me for just a minute watching this video. Hi, Janet. Hi. I understand that you went through a difficult situation a few years ago. I would love to hear your story because what happened to you is exactly why our development and plan giving department exists, mm -hmm. to lower the stress of our <coughs> pastors and families in case something happens. Sure, let me tell you what happened. We had been in a family vacation in Colorado and while my family flew back home to Orlando, my son and his family drove to their home in Kansas. Sadly, during their journey, something terrible happened. They were involved in a terrible accident that sent all of them to the ICU. My husband and I flew back to assist in any possible way we could, and we encountered that my son and his wife were in coma for many days, wow. while my granddaughter, thank God, kept getting better each day to the point that she was able to be released from the hospital. Oh, and Janet, since you were the grandma, and the hospital already knew you and knew that you were there to help, for sure you were able to take her home, right? Well, unfortunately, no. The hospital didn't authorize us to take Eva with us because they didn't have the legal documents from her parents giving us permission to take her out of the hospital, so they decided to send Eva to a foster home. Wow. Um, we were totally devastated. We started praying for this stressful situation. To our benefit, the hospital couldn't find an immediate foster home to send Eva right away, so she remained there. We were blessed that in a few days, my son was able to come out of his coma, and he was able to finally give us um, the permission to take Eva with us by signing the proper documents. Wow, Janet. I know how stressful this time was for you and your husband. It was. And I wish this could be avoided. Thank you for sharing your testimony and helping us understand the importance of having the state plan documents and especially the power of attorney in place. Mm -hmm. Pastors and members, we plead with you to take advantage of this excellent service that your Florida Conference has for you free of charge. Avoid this type of situation and protect your family. So these documents, they provide for you and your family, they protect your family, and provide peace of mind. Now I know people are going to say, but isn't it expensive? Yeah, actually it kind of is. If you go to an attorney, and go through an, they're going to charge you anywhere from $750 to $1,000 or more. Through us, there's no charge whatsoever. The conference picks, currently we pick that up. There are some pressures for us to eliminate that from our budget, but right now, and it's been this way since the beginning, we'll pay that, that charge. We have attorneys that will do it at a reduced cost. They bill us. It doesn't cost you a thing. But now you're saying, but don't I have to leave everything to the church? No. There's no obligation, no strings attached. And In fact, I'm almost offended when people describe my department as, oh, those are the people that want your money. Actually, I'm not kind of offended. I'm really offended because I've never been that way. And, and that is not our interest whatsoever. Uh, we are here, well, this is a ministry, we are here truly for you. Many people do decide to include, you know, particularly their local church uh, in their estate plan, and that's beautiful and that's wonderful, but whether you do or not, we help you no matter what. So that's, that's, how, that's how we do it. Um, okay, enough about all that. I want to tell you about something that happened to me recently um, it's actually it's been exactly two years ago. My son and I were at Camp Kalakwa, and 
you guys are probably wondering, well, if that old guy's got a son, he's got to be grown, right? No, we started late. So I have, I have a 15-year-old at home right now, um, and he was 13 at the time. Anyway, we were clowning around, as sons and dads have a tendency to do, and he jumped on me. We fell together. Both his weight and my weight landed just on one particular part of my leg, and it jammed the femur, which is your leg bone, into the socket. Yeah, and it was ow. Um, it shattered the socket. And so, um, you know, fairly, fairly major surgery, about four-hour surgery. Um, so anyway, it was just a freak accident. You know, just, I mean, and, and the doctor even said, the surgeon said, you know, I rarely, the only time I see accident, injuries like this is in car wrecks. He asked me, I've been in a car right now. He said, this is, you know, that's the level of impact that generally has to happen. So I asked myself, I was like, especially when I was in pain, I was like, Lord, why me? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not that old, right? And, you know, it's, uh, it's a freak accident. You know, why me? And it just got me thinking about the Bible and about people that are in the Bible. Um, and who might have said, why me? And, and instantly, and, and probably in your mind too, a lot of examples come to mind. I mean, just, you know, early in the Bible, we find Moses, right? And he is, um, he's run away, and he's living with Jethro, and all of a sudden, he sees this, this bush burning, right? But it's not burning up. And he goes over and explores, and the Lord says, you know, I want you to, to go to my people. And what does he say? I am slow of speech, right? Send somebody else. Why me? Why me? Right? And, I mean, it's so bad that God has to say, okay, I'll... I'll bring your brother on board, right? We'll get Aaron to go, but I'm only talking to you, and, and Aaron will speak for you, but, you know, that's... Moses was basically saying, why me? I'm slow of speech. I have uncircumcised lips. So, even though Moses was afraid and did not understand... Why me? Why God had chosen him? He was able to perform the miracles and, and ultimately, we know, led the Israelites to the promised land. But another example, one of my favorite stories in the Bible came to mind, and that was Gideon, right? And where do we find Gideon when we, when we find him in the Bible? He's hiding, right, in a wine press, okay, because of the Midianites that have attacked and are oppressing them. And so... When the angel comes to him, when the Lord comes to him and says, you know, I want this. Um, when the Lord told him he would save Israel from the Midianites, what does he do? He asks for proof, right? He asks for signs. And not one sign, not two, he actually asks for three different signs. And to this day, we even say, put out a fleece, right? So... Um, Again, he's basically saying, why me? In fact, he even says, you know, I'm from the tribe of Manasseh. We're the smallest tribe. And I'm the smallest member in our tribe. Why me? I'm the littlest guy. You know, how am I going to save our people from the Midianites? But in spite of the fear and the doubt, Gideon routed the Midianites and became a judge of Israel. Perhaps the most famous why me in the Bible would be Jonah, right? I mean, the Lord told him to do something, and what did he do? Yeah, he booked the first cruise ship going the other direction, right? I mean, he was, he was out of there. Um, but, you know, and so obviously he was saying, you know, Lord, why me? Why are you asking me to go to Tarshish and do, you know, so, and then, but think about the disciples. Matthew, the tax collector. Peter, the fisherman. You know they were saying, 
why has this guy chosen me? You know, why me? So <clears throat> I began to feel like I was in pretty good company for, <laughs> for my situation, as bad as I felt like it was at the time. Sometimes we are chosen to face trials and tribulations, and sometimes we're chosen to do great works. We may never know this side of heaven why God has chosen us for one or the other, a trial and tribulation or, or a great opportunity. But we know because Romans 8.28 tells us that all things work together for good to those who know and serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 So we can have faith in that. I know that I was called of God for what I am doing right now. I was not raised Adventist. I am probably the least worthy and least one that you would expect to be up here right now. Uh, I knew I was Christian all my life, even very, very young. I believed in God and I knew God loved me. But my family, I love my family, wonderful family, wonderful childhood, but we were at best nominal Christians. We were the Christmas and the Easter Christians. So, um, but uh, once I, I met my wife and her family and all that and began to encourage me uh, in, in Bible studies and that kind of thing, and I was having morning devotions, and I'll never forget this, we were sitting at my kitchen table, my wife had not gotten up yet, and I was sitting there at the kitchen table and um, just reading my Bible and God spoke to me. Now, I'm not sure anybody else in the room would have heard it, but I definitely heard it. And at the time, I was a banker. I had a finance career. I was working for Wachovia Bank. And God said to me, Phil, what are you doing? And I said, I'm a banker. You know, I, I, I you know, work at the bank. He said, you know, I'm not really a big fan of borrowing and lending. <laughs> and uh, I said, Lord, what, what would you have me do? What do, you, do you need somebody to count your money? I mean, I was facetious. I could not believe. And to this day, I can't believe a lightning bolt didn't come down, right? Because, I mean, how disrespectful was that? But that's how I responded. Lord, what do you need? Somebody to count your money? And he said, just pray about it. Just pray about it. Like, okay, I can do that. I can do that. That was in December. So every morning during my devotion, I, Lord, what would you what, lead me, guide me? I'm still working, you know, at the bank. You know, what would you have me do? Um, so every morning I prayed about it. Eventually, four months later. Uh, he opened up the door for me to join a wonderful organization called Adventist Frontier Missions. Um, and it was really um, providential how that came about. It was very interesting. This was back in 2008. And you guys may remember 08, 09. Something kind of happened to the economy. <laughs> like, right? <laughs> well, when you're in banking, that's not a good thing. Um, so... Um, I had be begun some conversations with AFM, Adventist Frontier Missions, and they eventually did give me a job offer. And then I was really kind of perplexed because I actually loved my job, and I loved where we lived, and we had a, a lot of friends, and I was an elder at our church at this point, and, and you know... So you kind of begin to wonder, oh, wait a minute, you know, am I kind of just making something happen, you know? And so the prayer on my wife's lips and mine were, Lord, please, no ambiguity. Because I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you're kind of like, do I go this way? Do I go that way? Lord, what do you want me to do? The next morning... I got fired from the job. <laughs> Be careful what you pray for. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, and, and, and my boss said, it was so funny, actually, because he called me. I was in a different building, and he called me. He said, Phil, I need to see you. And it was one of those tones that it's like, uh-oh, you know, what did I do? And I just closed a $10 million loan, so I was kind of racing, going in my mind, did I, oh, did I not qualify the, the lender? Did I make a mistake? Did I? And, um, but... Um, so I was driving to his office, and I got there. He's sitting there at a table in his office with the HR director. Now, if you don't know what that means, <laughs> that's never a good thing. I'll tell you something else, though. On my way over there, I was praying, Lord, if this is, you know, something like this, please let there at least be a small severance package because I needed some bridge time, right? So sure enough, he says, Phil, you haven't done anything wrong the, the economy is just totally tanked. And th at this point, we were about seven months into the economy and really, really bad. Um, and he said, you, you were the last one that we brought on to this department, and you got to go. So it was so funny, though, because I, I think I must have had this really strange smile on my face because he, he, he reached across the table and said, Phil, do you realize we're letting you go? <laughs> It was so funny. Uh, <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. I, got, I had tears in my eyes. I, was, I couldn't wait to get out of there to call my wife. <laughs> but I tell you, if you're ever in this position, pray for a large severance package, not a small one. <laughs> because that's what I got was a small severance. But the Lord provided. It was enough to, to get us through that. But anyway, um, so... But that was my calling into the Lord's work, and that's been, I don't know, 15 or more years ago now, maybe 20. Um, but, and then I had an equally providential call to come here to Florida, and it's just been amazing how the Lord has worked in my life and called me. Um, and I'll tell you, when I was working for the bank, um, I felt very hollow inside. You know, I just, it, it was not fulfilling for me. Um, I found it difficult to, to, to be evangelistic. To, I mean, I just, I, just, I just, I don't know. And so working in the Lord's work has been very, very, very fulfilling for me. And so anyway, <clears throat> um, find meaning and purpose in my life. Um, and I can't tell you, I cannot begin to tell you the number of people who after having gone, you know, used our ministry to get their estate plans in place, that, you know, I've said, Phil, thank you so much. I had no idea, you know, what we were lacking or, or what needed to be done um, for either themselves or for their children or whatever. Um, so it, it's been a great stress reliever for them, uh, provided a lot of peace of mind. I'm going to close with this. I just want to say, I don't know what the Lord is is saying to you and what he's calling you to do you know maybe he's not you know asking you to leave lead several million people out of Egypt right uh, or maybe he's not even asking you to change your job all right but maybe he's saying you could volunteer for the church a little bit more you know maybe he's saying hey our our school down the road needs a little bit of help Maybe, you know, maybe you could volunteer there or do something there. I want to challenge you. I want to close with this. I want to challenge you with a 40-day challenge that you'll spend the next 40 days every day praying, Lord, where would you have me be? What, what can I be doing for your work? And the important part, I'll tell you, at least for me, the important part of the prayer was after I talked, shutting up and giving the Lord the chance to speak back. Don't just talk and cut it off, but take a minute and let him talk to you. Thank you for letting me be here today. Um, let, me, let me pray for us one more time, if I may. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, what an honor and privilege it is to be about your business. Um, I pray your blessing. Father, upon all of these folks here and all of those that they love, uh, keep us safe, Lord, not only physically, but emotionally and spiritually. Keep us close to you, I pray. And we thank you in Jesus' name.
Amen.